Let me give you all a real warm welcome in the name of the Lord along to our Tuesday evening service here. Um, time of Bible study, a time of communion, and also a time of prayer. Uh, it is Teaching Tuesday for the folks that are watching online tonight, and we welcome our online congregation, our friends that are just sitting in the comfort of their own home, whether they're in front of the laptop or the TV or um, their smartphone, whatever it may be. It's lovely to have you, and we just trust that you'll be blessed also um, through the course of our study together. Um, and so as we welcome you, I see a few new faces here tonight. You are more than welcome in the name of the Lord, and we do pray that you'll be blessed um, in our time together. I'm going to start off our service tonight um, singing a lovely old hymn, Rock of Ages, Cleft for Me. So we're going to stand together, and we're going to sing and minister unto the Lord. So let's change positions. Let's stand and let's lift our voice in praise. And you that are watching, sing along with us. Amen. Rock of ages, clear for me. Let me hide myself in thee. Let the wall to begin our evening service tonight. Just going to come before the Lord right now in prayer, just asking for the Lord's blessing upon our service together tonight as we just very shortly open up God's Word. And as we stand here tonight, we continue to think of bereaved families. We continue to think of those that are sick and needy. And we just continue to pray for our community. We continue to pray for our own province. Pray for our church and uh, our witness here in this area. And so we're just going to bow right now, and let's come before the Lord. Heavenly Father, we thank you that we can come before our rock tonight. Lord, we thank you that, Lord, as in, the, in the words of the old divine, the old Scottish divine Samuel Rutherford, when he said those words, that there's no shame on a drowning man, grabbing hold of a rock. And Lord, we thank you that we grabbed the hold of you so many years ago. And to think of everyone here tonight that is 
born again of God's Spirit, Lord, we have grabbed the whole of a rock. We're in solid ground tonight. And Lord, we thank you that we are on that ground. And so as we come before you, we just, Lord, ask for your blessing upon our service tonight. Lord, I thank you for everyone that you've brought into your midst. And you know every home, you know every heart, you know every situation. Even with our folks that are here in church, I just pray, Lord, that you would meet each one at the point of need. And I pray, Lord, for our friends that are watching online tonight. Again, Lord, even beyond the camera here, there are homes where there's needs, where there's problems, where there's concerns. And Lord, we just stand with our friends that are watching on tonight, asking that you would really draw near and meet them also at the point of need. Lord, we continue to pray for bereaved families, asking that you would comfort them as only you can. Lord, we continue to pray for people that are sick and needy, even within our own church fellowship, and we ask, Lord, that you would minister to them in a special way. Lord, we ask for our own ministries here in the church. Lord, for your blessing. It was lovely to meet with the youth leaders last night, and Lord, even as we would start to make plans of opening up again, Lord, we just pray, Lord, that you would make that way possible, even for those few weeks over the summer, and then just to resume our activities again in September. Lord, I pray for our youth club. I pray for all of those kids. I thank you, Lord, how it has built up over those years. Lord, how you've given us 150 kids. And I pray for every one of them. And I pray for their families. I pray, Lord God, that, that they're safe, that they're well, especially during this whole time of pandemic. And Lord, your hand will be upon each one. And Lord, so we just commit and commend that particular ministry along with the senior citizens. Lord, we pray for them, Lord, that they'll be able to resume again. While I'm thinking about the senior citizens, again, we just continue to pray for the Briars family circle, that you'll continue to comfort Alan and Jacqueline and all of the family at this time. So Lord, do us good. Let this be a lovely time of Bible study. Let us learn from your word. Lord, as we draw near to you later on with communion and, and also as we have a time of prayer, Lord, would you bless our time together and let each one, Lord, be so enriched uh, through our time here tonight. And we ask this, giving you thanks for Jesus' sake. Amen. Amen. So we're just... I'm going to open up God's Word very, very shortly. Um, before we do that, I just want to remind folks um, of some uh, announcements. Um, so, God willing, um, our next meeting will be here on Sunday morning at 11.30. Uh, we're so pleased to see our Sunday morning, uh, the increase especially of the kids and the adults and over the next couple of weeks, you're not going to see too much of the kids because um, they're going to be um, going across the way uh, pretty quickly at the, towards the beginning of the service because um, they're going to be practicing. We're having a Children's Day here. Uh, I think it's the 4th of July, the first Sunday in July. And um, we look forward to the kids um, being here that Sunday morning. You're going to hear some of them reading from God's Word. They're going to be singing to us. And we're going to be watching also, God willing, the DVD uh, in relation to uh, a Bible story. And we're also going to give them praise. All the kids that come here, they'll be given a praise just as a reward, as a thanks uh, for them coming every week. It's great to see them here, isn't it? And so we want to reward them uh, while we're here. So we really look forward to Children's Day uh, in a few weeks' time and uh, praying for God's blessing upon uh, that particular service. But this coming Sunday um, morning at 11.30, uh, again, we'll be opening up God's Word. and It'll be recorded, uh, it'll be a live broadcast on, on Facebook later on and uploaded on YouTube. Um, but this coming Sunday, we're continuing in the book of Nehemiah. Uh, where we've been for quite a while. I think this week will be our 10th study. And this coming Sunday, uh, really following on from where we left off last week, where we were in chapter 8, and we looked at the Revival Bible Conference at the Watergate. This coming Sunday, God willing, we're going to have a look at the reinstitution 
of a sacred feast, a feast that practically had been neglected and had been dormant in Israel for years. And it's a wonderful feast, a very meaningful feast. It's called the Feast of Tabernacles. And uh, so we're going to have a look at that, God willing, on Sunday morning, how that Nehemiah got that reinstituted into the nation. And uh, we're going to have a look at what that tabern- what the, the feast was all about uh, as we open up God's Word on Sunday morning. Um, and then also Christianity Explored uh, will be happening on Sunday night at 6.30. You are coming to the wind down, aren't you? Um, off it, you've got this week and I think the following week, if I'm right. And, um, and so we're really just praying for God's blessing. We're delighted that that's been a great success. And the mixture of people that have come along week after week, uh, some folks that are unsaved, new converts, um, people that are just you know exploring God's word and backsliders, all sorts of folks that have come together, and you know the reports that we have received. It's been we're so delighted that this has worked so well. And talking to Mark yesterday, and and I know that we we're thinking about and the people that you folks that have been a part of it is would like to continue on. Uh, and so there's another uh, course that's called Hope Explored, which really looks at the book of Philippians looks who God is, uh, you know, and that'll be a good follow-on to what you have studied already in Christianity Explored. And so we'll give you more information about that um, as the time goes on. I'm sure Mark will want to have a chat with you this week, and then we'll see where we go with it. So well, I think that's basically all of our announcements out of the way. We look forward to Sunday. Uh, but please put the first Sunday in July very much in, in, in your dates and come along and support the children uh, who come here week after week and um, let's really spoil them and love them and just enjoy them that particular morning. God bless the leaders as they go out uh, as, as well and you know, getting into the whole practice mode and getting everything sorted. Uh, God bless you all also. So there we go. We're ready for a time of Bible study, all of our announcements. So if you've brought a Bible with you, or if you haven't got a Bible, don't worry, because the words will be on the screen. Um, Or again, if you're following on through um, some electronic device, if you're using your phone or your iPad or or laptop or whatever electronic device you have, just to upload the Bible, and we're going to the little letter of Jude. Um, Just before we get to the end of the Bible, Revelation Jude is there. There's just 25 verses. And last week was our introductory study. We looked at the first four verses. Uh, And so tonight we're going to have a look uh, from verses 5, just to verse 7, just a few verses. And we'll see what God's Word wants to say. So please just keep your Bibles open and let God's Word speak to you as we read. So we are in Jude, we're in the fifth verse, and continuing on from last week, he says these words. But I want to remind you, though you once knew this, that the Lord having saved the people out of the land of Egypt, afterwards destroyed those who did not believe. And the angels who did not keep their proper domain, but left their own abode, he has reserved in everlasting chains under darkness for the judgment of that great day. As Sodom and Gomorrah and the cities around them in a similar manner to these, having given themselves over to sexual immorality, and gone after strange flesh, are set forth as an example, suffering the vengeance of eternal fire. And we'll just stop there tonight and pray that God will bless his word to our hearts. Again, keep your Bibles open and just, just as we have read those words, just pray inwardly, Lord, your word is a living word. Speak to me through your word. Let it come alive. Let me learn through what we have just been reading tonight. And so in our introductory study last week, as I've already mentioned, we looked at the first four verses of 
only 25 that are recorded in Jude's letter. And we mentioned how that this letter was written at a time when the church was very much under attack from the influence of apostasy. Apostasy that had crept in through the devilish work of apostates. For the benefit of those who weren't here last week, we really just labored on those two words, apostasy and apostates. And so how would we again describe them? Well, apostasy is described as follows. A renunciation of a belief formerly held. Or as Wikipedia puts it, the rejection of the Lord Jesus Christ by one who had been a Christian. And if you remember, I gave an example from many years ago when we stood in the city centre giving out tracts and a well-dressed man coming out of one of the pubs or clubs walked past me when we offered him a tract and he just looked at me and he said, "Um, listen, stop what you're doing because there's no God. I know because I once was a minister and stood behind a pulpit and preached what you're doing. And so that was an example of someone who is an apostate. You know, someone who has, who was once a believer but has renounced his belief, turned away from it, rejected the Lord Jesus Christ. And there's many of them out there, folks. An apostate we've just described, someone who once believed and then rejected the truth of God and his word. And we gave examples of that last week. You know, we stand here and it's fair to say that, you know, even when we think of um, preachers, ministers who would stand behind pulpits who would deny the divinity of Christ, others who would tell you that the virgin birth is a complete myth, that Mary was raped by Roman soldiers and the virgin birth didn't happen. Bodily resurrection, his body was stolen. They'll come up with any kind of a suggestion to reject those fundamental truths from the Bible. We also talked about atheists, people who don't believe. And that's, that may be hard to believe, but it's true that we have men and women, we have people standing in pulpits who are atheists. It's just a job to them. They don't believe They don't believe in the word of God. They don't believe in what they're doing. It's hard to believe that people would go along and sit and listen to people of that ilk, isn't it? But it is out there, folks. We're not making this up. It is very, very true. And so when we go back to Jude's day, apostasy was something that was talked about. We only have to read this letter again. We only have to dip into the second letter of Peter was talked about, it was prophesied about, it was warned against, and it's easily traced the whole way through the New Testament. And it wasn't just restricted to the first century church, as I've just mentioned, but has continued on right through the church age to this present day. And so those who stood for truth, those who contended for the faith, Way back in Jude's day, Jude is writing to them and he's saying to them, look, we're giving you the assurance, living in days of apostasy, that you're loved, that you're guarded, and that you're preserved in Christ. That was the message that Jude had for the believers that he was writing to. He was saying to them, look, you're living in difficult times. All of this is around you. You have apostasy and false teaching that's rife, along with... You know, when we think of the persecution of the early church, it was a very difficult time to be a Christian. And Judah's writing this letter and he's saying to them, look, no matter what you're going through, you're loved. Nothing's going to change God's heart for you. He loves you with an everlasting love. You're guarded in Christ. You're protected. You're preserved in Christ. No matter what's happening all around you. And we also tonight, folks, living here, you know, in 2021, we also have that same assurance. I don't know 
how, what our mindset has been walking in through the doors tonight. But I want to assure you tonight that is listening on that you're loved, that you're guarded, and that you're preserved in Christ. If you're standing for the Lord tonight and standing for the truth of God's word, listen, you have that assurance also, living in days of apostasy. So in verse 4, Jude issues a warning to the apostates who was perverting the beliefs and the conduct of the church. Notice what he said in verse 4. For certain men have crept in unnoticed, who long ago were marked out for this condemnation, ungodly men who turned the grace of our God into lewdness and deny the only Lord God and our Lord Jesus Christ. And he's given that warning of those that crept in, perverting the belief and the conduct of the church. And then from verses 5 to verse 7, the verses that we have read tonight and we want to labor on tonight, I want you to see here in those few verses that Jude provides three well-known acts of apostasy that we find in the Old Testament. And he, he uses these examples to show that God would have the last say or the last word regarding these matters. One writer actually said regarding these verses that we read, verse 5 to verse 7, the evil men who were very much corrupt in the church with their teachings, they didn't regard themselves. These people didn't regard themselves as enemies of the church nor did they regard themselves as enemies of Christianity. What they did was they regarded themselves as advanced thinkers, or they were the spiritual elite. They were a cut above the ordinary Christian when it came to knowledge. And Jude has chosen his examples to make it clear that even if someone had received the greatest privileges, they may still fall into disaster. And even those who have received the greatest privileges from God, they can't consider themselves safe, but must be on constant watch against the mistaken things. These certainly are words for us to ponder upon. So the first warning that Jude gives is in verse 5, and it was the example of the children of Israel. Notice what he says. But I want to remind you, though you once knew this, that the Lord having saved the people out of the land of Egypt, afterwards destroyed those who did not believe. So we ask the question, what is Jude referring to here? What passage in the Old Testament is he talking about? Well, let me just go into a little bit of background. The mighty hand of God had already delivered Israel out of the slavery and the bondage of Egypt. When we read the book of Exodus through the leadership of Moses, leading two million people for 40 years. Incredible when you think about it. I'm, I'm, you know, coming out of Egypt, the bondage, the slavery that they had endured. Do you remember that time, you know, when... The message was clear, let my people go, and how Pharaoh had, you know, was so stiff-necked against the people of Israel, how God sent all of those plagues upon um, the Egyptians. Uh, and eventually, as they crossed the Red Sea and came into the wilderness and wandered in the wilderness, having left the slavery and the bondage of Egypt behind them, and God had guided them across the wilderness right to the borders of the land of promise. Numbers chapter 13 and chapter 14. Really good chapters to read. You may want to have a look at them later. Numbers 13 and 14 says that at the border, at a place called Kadesh Barnea, spies were sent out to spy the land, the promised land. And, and those spies returned with an accurate report concerning everything that God had already told them about the promised land. It was a place that was flowing with milk and honey. What a wonderful place it was. 
But because there was any enemy tribes, even then there was giants in the land, bigger than some of the fellows that come in here on a Sunday morning in the church. But because there was enemy tribes, giants who already lived there in the land, yes, there was big obstacles. Even viewing the promised land, you know, the way was not going to be smooth for the people of Israel. You know, after their wanderings in the wilderness just to go into their promised land, the land that God had promised them. And you see, the devil never makes it easy, does he? Of course he doesn't. You see, there was enemies there who needed to be overcome. But the question is this, in the light of what we have just read, had God failed them in the past? When we think of that journey, you know, out of slavery, out of bondage, right to the edge of the promised land, had God ever failed the Israelites? Read through the Bible and you'll see that no, the answer is no, he never had failed them. Never had failed them. And with the exception of two men, Joshua and Caleb, the spies returned with a very negative report. Apart from Joshua and Caleb. And that negative report suggested, look, there's dangers ahead. This looks a tough place. The enemy looks so strong. The Israelites, they couldn't even win their way into the promised land. Beat before the start, basically. And so these unbelieving spies that had come back with such a negative report, it was contrary to Joshua and Caleb's report because they were ready. Yeah, we can take on the land. We can go in there and occupy it. When do we start? Let's get going. But the unbelieving spies had really just, you know, had left their impression, left their mark. You know, they, they actually preferred to stay in the wilderness rather than to believe God. In fact, if you read through some of the references, you know, with the journeys of the children of Israel, there was those times where God's patience was stretched to the limit. God's servant Moses, I mean, he was in such a difficult position because they complained about everything, even the very food. They complained about being fed with manna that God had supplied them with, fresh heavenly food, morning and evening. And no, we would rather go back to cucumber. You know, all of the food tastes better back in Egypt. We'll go back again. There was this mentality that we would rather stay in the wilderness rather than to believe God and enter in the promised land. And God just got fed up with their complaints. All the murmuring, all the unbelief, all of the complaining, God heard it all. You know, that's a lesson that we all should remember, folks, when we complain and we murmur and, you know, about everything and anything. We forget that God hears and God listens. And he heard it all, all the murmuring, all the unbelief that led them down a slippery slope where the Israelites departed from the faith and truth. It was an example of apostasy that Judah's mentioning. God then made a decision because of their unbelief that all the people from 20 years old and above, except for Joshua and Caleb, they would die in the wilderness and they would not enter the land of promise. The younger generation, they would enter the land of promise. But the older, they wouldn't because of their unbelief. Even Moses himself, he didn't enter the promised land. He saw it, but he didn't enter it. And this story that Jude is mentioning here tonight actually troubled the apostle Paul enough to write about it as an example to the Corinthian church. In his first letter, 1 Corinthians 10, here's a references again, verses 4 to verse 12. You can read about it. And in verse 12, Paul gives a solemn warning to the church. Using the example of the Israelites, he says, therefore. And remember, folks, every time you see the word therefore in the Bible, it's there for a reason. Therefore, let him who thinks 
he stands, take heed lest he fall. And this message is a reminder to us all today. Folks, that we need to stay close to Christ and his word. That's what we need to do. We need to keep our faith strong in him. Not to be deviated to the right or to the left, but to keep our eyes on the Lord, to keep our eyes in the Bible. Keep reading the word of God and let God direct our steps. There's enough false teaching out there, you know, that, would, that looks so nice, that looks so glamorous, and that can easily sway you away from truth. And that's what apostates and apostasy tries to do. And so I'm encouraging you tonight, folks, keep your faith strong in the Lord. Keep your eyes in God's word and keep your faith strong as we look to the, to the Lord. We walk by faith and not by sight. That's the first example that Jude uses here as a sign of apostasy in the Old Testament, the children of Israel. Here's the second example of apostasy Jude mentions in verse 6. And it deals with the insurrection of Satan and his angels. Have a look at verse 6. God's word says, And the angels who did not keep their proper domain, but left their own abode. He has reserved in everlasting chains, under darkness for the judgment of that great day. So having already looked at the children of Israel and what that represents, here we have a look at what the Bible teaches regarding fallen angels or the fall of Satan and his angels. And we see very clearly that Jude points out that the result of the fall of angels was because of pride and rebellion. Keep those two words in mind. Pride and rebellion. The devil himself was a fallen angel. And Isaiah says these words. Again, you might want to mark these verses down. He says in chapter 14, verse 12, the prophet Isaiah, he says, How are you fallen from heaven, O Lucifer, son of the morning? And so what we see very clearly here, and I would encourage you to read those verses in Isaiah chapter 14, that the devil was put out of heaven because of pride and because of rebellion. I don't know if you have paid much attention that you knew that or you've studied much about that, but the devil, because of his pride, because of his rebellion, he came to that point where he said, I will be like the Most High. And you see, <laughs> God's not going to share his glory with anyone else, is he? And here we have the rebellion of Satan. I will be like the Most High. The devil saw himself as somebody that could usurp the throne, that could t challenge the authority of God. And he thought, well, I can be the number one. You know, so full of pride, so full of rebellion. That's in Isaiah 14. If you want to do a further study, you need to go into another prophet, into Ezekiel. Ezekiel chapter 28. The Bible is described as the anointed cherub. Satan is described as the anointed cherub. Don't get this impression in your mind. And I've mentioned this from the platform before, that the devil is like the image that you see in Manchester United. Kits, you know, this red, fearsome kind of figure that has this fork and looks really, really, oh goodness, I want to avoid him like a plague. I've said to you before that the anointed cherub, the devil was like a beautiful angel. You ladies, if he walked in here tonight, you'd be swooning all over him, thinking, look at this gorgeous figure walking in. But look so beautiful. And in verse 17 of Ezekiel 28, it reads, Your heart was lifted up because of beauty. He knew that he was good looking. 
He knew what it meant. You know, he could really make the heart tick, heart throb. That was the enemy, the devil. Mastered by pride. And Paul also tells us that he masquerades as an angel of light. And yet he's described also in the Bible as a lion seeking whom he may devour and a serpent who deceives. The Lord actually refers to Satan as as a liar from the beginning. The devil comes in John 10 verse 10. He comes to steal, to kill and to destroy. Now you want to ask yourself the question, why does the devil want to do that? Why does he want to steal? Why does he want to kill? Why does he want to to destroy? Well, if you can think back to those verses that we are reading, how that the enemy, because of his rebellion, because of his pride, he wanted to challenge God's power. And so therefore, when he was basically, for want of a better word, kicked out of heaven, thrown out of heaven, the devil very much hates God's creation. It's anything that is created of God. It's hard to imagine that tonight, folks. But the devil hates anything that's created of God. And yet we have in our world tonight where the devil has his own church. Scattered around the world. Churches of Satan. And listen, the devil believes in God. Don't be thinking that the devil is an atheist like human beings that are walking in Belfast. No, you actually read. I think it's in the book of James. It says, do you, tram, you, know, um, do, you believe, do you believe in God? So also does the devil and his angels. Oh, the devil believes in God, all right. <laughs> and he has his own church. And he has his own followers. And he masquerades as an angel of light. And I'm saying to you folks tonight, we should not be ignorant of his devices. Humanly speaking, none of us physically are a match for the devil. Being honest about it, none of us are. Of ourselves. But what I read in the Bible, I'm told how the devil is on a deadline. I'm told greater is he that is in us than he that is in the world? Oh, yes, folks. And I listen to some of these preachers, and they talk about, you know, I remember reading one fella, and he says, you know, we should say to the devil, make my day, punk. You know, like a scene out of Harry Callahan, you know, one of these films. You know, and I'm going, really? Make my day? <laughs> you know, folks, we, we, you know, we should not be flippant about these things. I'm certainly not here to elevate Satan in any shape or form because I do believe that he is a defeated foe. I really do believe that. But we should, you know, be, be aware. We should not be ignorant of his devices, folks. Pride. Rebellion. A lust for power. And because of Satan... And how the fallen angels sinned, Judah's referring to how that their sin is reserved for judgment. Referring to the final judgment when all the demons of hell and Satan are forever consigned to the lake of fire that is prepared for them that we read about in Revelation 20 verse 10. That's why I'm saying, folks, you know, As believers, let's keep our eyes on the Lord. Let's keep looking to the Lord. But the devil is a defeated foe, but we shouldn't be ignorant of his devices. It also says in 2 Peter chapter 2, verse 4, and I love the way Peter, remember that Peter wrote this letter to the same group of churches that Jude is writing to. And he says to them in 2 Peter 2, verse 4, For if God did not spare the angels who sinned, but cast them down to hell and delivered them into chains of darkness to be reserved for judgment. And Jude here associates the fall of the angels with the destruction of Sodom and Gomorrah. You know, a writer says, 
So Jude was speaking to his, the people, people that he was writing to, in terms that they could well understand. And he told them, if pride and lust and, you know, the desire for power, if it ruined the angels despite all of their privileges, pride and lust could also ruin them in the early church. And I'm saying to you tonight, folks, pride and lust and power and all of that can ruin us in the 21st century, living in 2021. Have we not read it? Do we not see it on our own television? People with pride puffed up, you know, that they think that they can go and do whatever they like. People that get above themselves, delusions of grandeur, they see themselves elevated by power, whether it's in the, the field of politics or sport or the music industry where they, you know, think of the music industry or the film industry where people become heartthrobs, they become like, you know, pin-ups, celebrities, and how people just drool over them and love them and, and set them up and elevate them, you know, when the superstars. And listen, it's also happened in the church, hasn't it? We've seen issues within the church, pride, lust and the ruination that it's been to people that have stood behind pulpits and preached God's word. And the evil apostates that had crept into the church in Jude's time, they were proud enough to think that they knew better than the teaching of the church. And they were lustful enough to pervert the grace of God and the justification for blatant immorality where they thought that they could just go and do whatever they liked and live whatever way they liked. And you know something tonight, folks? Whatever be the ancient background of his words, Jude's warning is still very much valid. The pride that knows better than God and the desire for bidden things are the way to ruin in time and for eternity. Would not that be true? So we need to take heed, folks, don't we? We need to take heed. And time's racing very quick. Well, it is by my watch. I don't know about this thing in front of me here. But as we heard on Sunday, we're all ready for a five to six hour service. The only thing is you're sitting instead of standing the whole time. <laughs> yeah, so we've already looked at children of Israel, example from the Old Testament. We've looked at the fallen angels, another example of apostasy in, in the Old Testament. Here's the third and the final example of apostasy that Jude in verse 7 refers to. And it was the destruction of Sodom and Gomorrah. And it's dreadful example to those who turn from God to follow their own lustful pleasures. Listen, the whole story is found in its entirety in Genesis 19, verses 1 to verse 29. And in that passage, as the old um, Baptist preacher, Charles Spurgeon, once said, describing Sodom and Gomorrah, he said it was a time where God poured hell out of heaven to destroy those cities. And Jude says in verse 7, As Sodom and Gomorrah and the cities around them, in a similar manner to these, having given themselves over to sexual immorality and gone after strange flesh. Remember last week we talked about one of the major doctrines or teachings in the New Testament, or, or sorry, in the, in the first century, was a doctrine called antinomianism. And it was the gospel of the flesh, where people could go out and live and do whatever they like. And, you know, because God is a God of love, you know, well, God is always going to forgive. But you know what? We'll just go and live whatever way we like. And we do whatever we like. And if we feel like it, then we'll go and we'll ask, we'll apologize later. That's the way it operated back then. Antinomianism. And so... Paul, uh, Jude says, having given themselves over to sexual immorality and gone after strange flesh, are set forth as an example, suffering the vengeance of eternal fire. In other words, 
you know, you can't just live whatever way you like and expect to get away with it, as far as God's concerned. And the story goes, looking at the example of Genesis chapter 19. And we're told in that chapter how the two angelic visitors have been invited to the home of Lot, the nephew of Abraham. Remember how that when Abraham came out of Ur of the Chaldees and went on a journey of faith where he didn't even know where he was going. Unfortunately, he had a little bit of baggage. And Lot was that baggage. And you know, he had to get rid of that baggage in order for him to progress. And you may remember, you know, it came to the point where the herdsmen were fighting among themselves. And Abraham says, Lot, look, you go one direction and I'll go the other. And we're told that Lot chose the well-watered plains of Sodom. And that's when the separation began between the two. Of Abraham and Lot. Lot arrives in Sodom, Gomorrah, and story we're told, two visitors were invited into his house to be his guests. And then those verses we're told in Genesis 19, how that the homosexual inhabitants of Sodom then surrounded his house when they heard that Lot's guests were inside. And we're told in graphic terms, and we can use our own imagination, how they beat on the door and they demanded that Lot would bring out his visitors that they should know them. Talk about sodomy being at the door, whose end was destruction. Because Sodom and Gomorrah, we're told, in those verses, were both destroyed by fire. What I learned during this study, and I didn't know this before, I'm told that the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah, some of the writers have said they are both buried beneath the Dead Sea in Israel. And we need to see clearly that God will judge any civilization that moves too far in this direction. I'm very conscious because this is a live broadcast tonight that we need to be very careful what we say regarding this. But we're sticking to what God's word says tonight. It's not my own interpretation. It's what God's word, and we only have to read it there. I've just given an overview of what we're told in Genesis chapter 19. That is the story. And we do believe that clearly that God will judge any civilization as we see the example of Sodom and Gomorrah that moves too far in this direction. And I wonder, and I just pose a question tonight, are we living in a society that has done just that? Have we moved too far? I wonder, in the words of old Dr. Billy Graham when he was living, and he said, You know, because of the society that we're living in today, will God one day have to apologize to Sodom and Gomorrah for the behavior that's happening in the days that we're living in right now? We leave that with you to ponder and to think about and to work out in your own minds. But the fate of the homosexuals and the unbelievers of those two cities in Genesis chapter 19, foreshadow in Jude verse 7 the fate of those people who deny God's truth and who ignore his warnings. Folks, unashamedly, I believe in the word of God. I believe in what the Bible teaches. I believe that the Bible is inspired of God. And when it comes to that particular subject, God's word is very clear. And if we have a situation where people who would have held to the belief of the Bible but have now walked away from it and they believe something contrary to what the Bible teaches is an example of apostasy and apostates. And these two cities are a foreshadow of the fate of those people who deny God's truth and who ignore his warnings. Folks, we need to watch, we need to pray, 
We need to heed the warnings tonight that come from God's word. Stick to the Bible, folks. That's my advice. Stick to God's word. Let God's word be our rule. Let God's word be our guide. And do you know what? If that makes us narrow-minded, then that makes us narrow-minded. If that makes us in the eyes of the world that we're bigots, then we're bigots. You know, because when I read in the, in, in the Bible, the Lord Jesus was regarded as a rock of offense, wasn't he? And the stone of stumbling. People got offended at his words, at what he taught. People got offended through what Paul taught, you know, what he preached. You know, we only have to read through the New Testament and many others, you know, like them, regarding the truths of God's word. And so if that labels us and puts us into, you know, a, a particular mindset, then so be it. But tonight, lovingly, you know, we say, to, you know, as people who love God's word, no matter who they are. Let, let, me, let me finish by saying this. When it comes to sin, God doesn't have a point system for sin. He doesn't have a point system. You know, in other words, you don't get 100 points for stealing an apple or 1,000 points if you're an abuser, for example, or if you're a pedophile. God doesn't look upon point systems. Sin is sin in God's eyes. And everyone walk in this world, no matter who they are, no matter what they are, they are sinners before God. And God has made a way where sinners can repent of their sins and put their faith and trust in Christ for salvation. Because the gospel message, according to the Bible that we read, is for the whosoever. Isn't it? Whosoever will may come. Anybody, no matter who they are. And then maybe there's somebody listening to me tonight. And I'm saying to you that it doesn't matter how dark your past may be. It doesn't matter how you've lived your life or what you've done. I'm saying to you tonight that there's love and mercy with the Lord. When you come humbly before him and you repent of your sin and you put your faith and trust in him. Could you imagine the Apostle Paul when he was walking this earth? before his conversion? Can you see this man who had a militant mindset, a man who hated Christians with like a passion, who was, who what you would call, the, you know, he, he, he was that militant figure that we would see in our world today that wanted to kill and to destroy. His idea was to wipe Christians off the map. And he was on, he, he was on a mandate. He was on a mandate to wipe out the church. But the Lord arrested him that day on the road to Damascus, saved him by his grace, turned his life right around and made him a preacher of the gospel. And won so many people for the Lord, planted churches. And do you know what? People are still reading his letters today. Do you know, God didn't cast him off. Maybe Paul would have came across people. Maybe he would have come across families that could have said to him, well, do you know what? You tried to arrest my brother, or you tried to arrest my sister, or you tried to do this, or you tried to do that. You know, and you know, it actually came to a point where Paul says, Look, I've got to put all these things behind me. Put them all behind me. In Philippians chapter three, and he said, You know what? I count not myself to have apprehended, but this one thing I do, forgetting the things that are behind and reaching forth unto those things that are before. That's what we've got to do, folks. Put our past behind us, look forward. And put her faith and trust in the Lord. And I would encourage anyone that is listening to me tonight to do that. Anyone living in this world can be saved. No one is outside the bounds or the reaches of God's love and God's mercy. And do you know what? You that are listening, you pause for a moment and you thank God that you've been a recipient, as I have, of God's grace. Where would we be tonight? Where would we be if Jesus hadn't loved us? Where would we be tonight if he hadn't have saved us by his grace and kept us by his power? Thank God for the gospel tonight. Thank God for the truth of it. Let's just pray. Lord, we 
see the examples that are set out for us in your word. Jude referring to the apostasy that happened in the Old Testament and just using it as an example to the, the church that he was writing to and how it's an example even for us living in our world today. Thank you, Lord, for the assurance that we have in days of apostasy. Lord, not only are we loved, protected, cared for, but thank you, Lord, that we can live for you. Lord, I pray in the name of Jesus for anyone that has listened on tonight, no matter who they are, no matter what background they're from, I pray in the name of Jesus, Lord, that they will lift their eyes to you. Lord, that they would put their faith and trust in you for salvation. That they will call upon the name of the Lord. Because we're reminded, anyone who calls in the name of the Lord shall be saved. Lord, bring salvation to this world of ours tonight. Bring salvation into the homes of families that are watching on tonight. Lord, bring salvation even into this church. If there's somebody sitting listening who hasn't as yet, put their faith and trust in you. Lord, thank you that you love the world, this world, no matter who we are, no matter what we are or what we have done. Thank you, Lord, that you love us. Thank you for your love. Lord, hear us tonight. And thank you for the blessed assurance that we can sing off that Jesus is mine and that this is our story and this is our song, singing of your blessed assurance tonight. Lord, hear us for Jesus' sake. Amen. Let's stand and sing those words, blessed assurance.
And as always, we want to thank the folks that have watched on tonight uh, on our Teaching Tuesday. God bless you. And uh, again, we would encourage you to switch on on Sunday morning and uh, join with us at 11.30 uh, for our next live broadcast. God bless you all.